Hello, and welcome to Locutors of Trek Supplemental, the podcast where we talk about the people, places, and things of Star Trek. So, grab yourself a Tarkalian or Cardassian red leaf tea, and join us far beyond the stars. Locutors of Trek. Program initiated. Enter when ready. It's me, Dave. And me, Davin. We are returning here again for a... Uh, for episode three, four, indeed. five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> of our supplemental series. No, three. This is episode three, and this this one, as you may have guessed from our, our very jazzy intro there, uh, <laughs> is... This one's about Lower Decks. We are the Locutors of Decks. Indeed. Locutors of Decks. I love Locute or I love Lower Decks. <laughs> I love Locutors of Trek too, but I, uh, I also love Lower Decks. Yeah, Lower Decks for those who I, I don't know how you haven't heard of it, but maybe you haven't. And if not, then you're in for a treat. Maybe uh, you're on those upper decks and you just don't know what's going well, that's down. That's true. There lower decks. Uh, it's a you know brand new animated Star Trek series that began airing this fall. Is that right? And it uh, was it described itself as being about the support crew of one of the least important ships in Starfleet. The USS Cerritos. Little Hills. That's right. Yeah. A California class cruiser, I think. Pretty ship, I like it. Well they're lovely ships. Mm -hmm. I mean I do have a question about how the ship works. Just right off the top. Mm -hmm. It it's just it's about it's about turbo lift placement. Yes, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh -huh. Because you know how the whole I mean the, all the turbo lifts would have to go through those pylons to get to the engineering hull, which seems busy. But well, that's uh, that's my only real design question. But otherwise, it's a lovely ship. has a has an interior design reminiscent of uh, a few periods of ship design. You know those great bunks that the lower decks crew are sleeping in feel very much like. The interior, say, of a Constellation class, the sort of crew spaces we saw there, even if they were in rooms in that instance, they had that sort of a feel about them. Uh, and other parts of the ship felt very much like a um, somewhere between a an Intrepid and a Defiant class in terms of design inside. And then you had the, the, the sort of lounge space, which was a really neat, kind of interior space we haven't seen on a starship before but was reminiscent for me of the bar in for whatever reason it was reminiscent of the bar interior in the old i guess it was like a k5 style station on the trouble with tribbles episode hmm. uh, yeah. of the original series and yeah. then of course mm -hmm. uh it's ds9 counterpart uh kind of reminded me of that bar a little bit yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I like that about it. I'm like, yeah, it's nice. I like it. Mm -hmm. Nice ship. Yeah, lovely bridge setup. It's got a bad rap. It's a good ship. Yeah. Tougher than good they crew. look. Good crew. Yeah. So, captained by Carol Freeman. Carol Freeman. First officer, or commander, Ransom. Mm hmm Both humans. And uh, they have quite a diverse crew. Uh, Bajoran tactical officer, Acacian Shax, medical yeah, officer. Shax is great. Ta'ana. Yeah, she's just a grumpy kitty. She's very much a kitty. <laughs> oh, what do they say? Oh, she's just a cat in a coat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, honestly, Cations are one of my favorite Star Trek species. Yeah, they're an artistic people. They uh, have deep love and reverence for family, I but love they have a hugely so. adventurous. <laughs> trick, you know, yeah. uh, and Tana's clearly uh, been around enough times and seen enough things that she's just not there for your BS, Mister. Yeah. Basically. She's the closest character I think we've gotten to Pulaski. <laughs> <laughs> but in some ways, somewhere between Bones and Pulaski, almost, you know? Yeah. 
Um, then we have the Lower Decks crew, who are the main characters. Well, there's the Chief Engineer fella. Yeah. I forget his name. So do I. Yep. yep. He doesn't, you don't see him a whole lot. No, just in a couple of places. Uh, Rutherford's very excited about him, of course. No, for a while. He's, uh, big, he's big time engineer. Oh, yeah. Now, Rutherford, of course, is the first of our Lower Decks crew that we'll introduce, I guess. Sam yep. Rutherford and Edson from Engineering and Operations. Samantha. Samantha. That's right. Samantha. Samantha. <laughs> Samantha Rutherford. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who has, with a history I'd love to learn, yeah. a cybernetic implant. Yeah, that's my biggest question right away. Hand. I wanted to bring that up. Why does he have a cybernetic implant? Great question. Can people just get cybernetic implants, or does he need the cybernetic implant? Because it's brand new. When the first mm -hmm. episode hits, it's like he's had it for two weeks. That's so, right. So... Like, did he get the side of it's his... Vulcan. It's a Vulcan implant. It's a Vulcan implant. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's why it was making circuit. him quite that's logical right. in the that's first right. episode. So, yeah, for some reason, but he's why? gotten a Vulcan cybernetic implant. Yeah. Which I think is fascinating, first of all. There's to not me, a huge history of... Wildly fascinating, and I have to know why. <laughs> it's yeah. Just... Wait, 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 I suppose I, I say there's not a huge history, but, I mean, loads of people have cybernetic bits. Or at least mechanical or artificial bits. Sure, in uh, uh, Discovery. Uh, Discovery, Denver Picard's gets... got an artificial heart. But she got it because of an injury. Okay. Oh, that's it. right, she Picard did. Picard yeah. got it because of an injury. Yeah. So Jordy's it... visor is essentially to... he was born blind. Uh, yeah, to, to afford him vision. Gotta love uh, Boimler's Jordy teddy bear that he <laughs> <before>. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the next character we could bring up, I suppose, is Brad, Brad, Bradward Boimler. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's Bradley's Bradwards. He's a Bradward. Yeah, Bradward. Bradward. Um, he's uh, a go-getter. Oh, he... um, ambitious. He's... Yeah. He writes uh... five personal logs a day. <laughs> That's excessive. The cat... <laughs> That's excessive. Yeah, he's, he's uh, determined to rise through the ranks. Well, let's round out our crew yeah. so far. We've got uh, we Ensign Tendi. Tendi. Everybody's speaking Orion. Orion. Orions are now in Starfleet. Mm -hmm. In uh, the in what twenty? Well, uh, now what's the year? maybe she's the an Orion in Starfleet in twenty three eighty. Twenty three eighty. Uh, certainly, the Orion Syndicate's still around in twenty three eighty. We know that. But like, um, some Orions haven't been pirates for five years. <laughs> 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 That's one of my favorite lines of the whole series. Yeah. Five, Five years. years. Oh, man. Um, and it, clearly, she's referencing some kind of a, a, a transformation of Orion culture. Yeah, or, a, or a bit. There. Or maybe some sort of breakaway yeah. portion. But it's also been true that... Like, I don't think the Orions are in the Federation. I don't think so. But non-Federation individuals certainly have mm -hmm. many times joined Star Trek. Oh, Bajorans. Uh, the Bajorans, in fact, yeah, there's lots of Bajorans out there. So that that's not really a, a huge issue, but it certainly does... You need to be, as Nog says, you need to be recommended by a command officer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're a non-Federation. Yeah. And perhaps that's how, that's Tendi's background. Maybe she was born on a Federation world and is a Federation citizen, but happens oh. to be an Orion, right? Oh, could be. Could have been. I'm sure there's lots of does Federation... Does it work like Orions. that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, we'll have to get into that in a different episode. Well, maybe That's an episode on politics yeah. or uh, immigration law. Maybe we'll just stick to politics. Yeah. <laughs> that might all be walking right. way outside our expertise. And then, of course, our final Lower Decks character Beckett is... Beckett Mariner. Beckett Mariner. Who I put on my dream crew as my tactical officer uh -huh. in the last episode. Yeah, I love Mariner. Love the whole Lower Decks crew. Mm -hmm. So Beckett Mariner has already got an interesting and storied career. Mm -hmm. uh, she's As an ensign? As an ensign. <laughs> I think she has been passing up opportunities mm -hmm. for advancement. She's chosen to remain a Lower Decks crew member. Uh, and partly because of getting, over the years, increasingly jaded about Starfleet, I think. Because some of, of her, that due to her own trauma. Perhaps her mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of the losses I think she experienced during sure. her earlier service. Yeah, her best friend got eaten by some sort of monster right in front of her. Like... Exactly, a shapeshifter type of thing. Mm -hmm. And she did, as she said, some serious weird black ops stuff at one point. So that can also have the effect of creating moral distress. In it. I think that's one of the things that makes Mariner compelling to me. Mm -hmm. She's... You know, when you first meet her in those first few episodes, she does seem to be running. Just completely looney tunes, right? Mm -hmm. She's obviously well, she's drunk. <laughs> just 
pounding against the walls of sort of her own, like the prison that is her life almost, yeah. you know? Yeah, and, and so watching her sort of come around to something of herself again, or which for us is getting to meet her for the first time in a way, is, is I think it's a lovely art. But yeah, okay, well, uh, Lower Decks, first episode, second contact. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which, you know, okay, here's the thing about that. They act like that's a bad thing, right? Mm-hmm. But to me, second contact feels way more interesting than first contact. Because first contacts all seem to be pretty much the same. Just like, mm-hmm. we are from the Federation. Here's what, you know, your choice is. If you mm-hmm. would like to sure. have you dialogue hang. with us. Yeah. yeah. You want to hang. Yeah. Yeah. You know, kind of, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it's a new, you know, mm-hmm. society and mm-hmm. it's exciting. But it's the same thing. For a second contact, you really get to experience that society a bit. Yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. And I, I think it's first it's to get really to know point. them almost, you know. Yeah, yeah, because they're they're you're spending more time, you're building links like communications and all sorts of stuff. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, I think we we talked about this maybe in our very first episode. The whole podcast that in in a certain sense the the moment of first contact, at least to my mind, is essentially the foundational kind of myth. Or foundational story, but also the foundational ritual act of the Federation. It's you know, the, it's reliving the Zephyr Cock. Exactly yeah. right. It's and and in that moment, so, so that's exciting for them. You want somebody to be your Zephyr Cochran so you can be their Vulcans. Mm-hmm. I think that's where. But who, we never know who that guy is. The Vulcan who just comes over and does that. Like, <laughs> what's his name? Ted. Ted. Um... <laughs> Ted Doc. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at naming Vulcans. But yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's, and I think that's what this sort of premise joke of the whole series is, right? That this is a ship that isn't a big, it's a little hill. Underachieves a little bit, perhaps. Exactly. And it's like, it's, it's sort of a ship full of not the brightest stars in Starfleet. Not necessarily, no. But. Captain Freeman seems a little aloof at times. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Shax is kind of psychotic. I love Shax. <laughs> he's a great character, but he's absolutely psychotic. Okay, so uh, new seats. We agreed on tan with leather stripe in the center. I thought we agreed that leather stripe was too ostentatious. <laughs> he's all like, we did not all agree. <laughs> it's funny how uh, Mariner makes fun of their like senior staff meetings and how they're so boring. <laughs> what are you guys doing now? Discussing the prime directive again? Oh, super exciting. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, second contact. Whereas Boimler's super excited to like go like wash their chairs because oh, they man. might be in there talking while he does it. <laughs> <laughs> he is he's he's got uh, he's he really kind of oozes desperation. We're not here to have fun. We're here to starfleet. Tell that to Tendi. That's true. She has a good time. Tendi has a good time pretty much doing anything. She's very excited. Uh, very excited. Yeah. What's that line? Does that mean we're best friends? I'm going to die with my best best friend! friend. Yeah! (laughs) We'll get to that episode. Second contact. So yeah, the opening scene is Drunk Mariner. That scene is the most dangerous a Batleth ever seems in in all of Star Trek. Because Batleths do a lot of clinging and clanging and never really do a lot of damage in a lot of Star Trek. But she cleaves a a, a chunk of off of Boimler's leg <laughs> and she's just kind of drunk swinging it around like it's actually sharp she cleaves a chunk oh, a God. huge chunk oh, that you see the bone more than the dermal regenerator yeah exactly I'm like oh my god that batleth was scared she really carved it up oh, yeah. he's doing one of his five personal logs of the day I was surprised in one, uh, just before we one I was surprised by just how effective a story that was really recognizably like in feel in even in some sense in the kind of tone of the way the story worked maybe not the humor tone but the other stuff and just in the kind of logic of the story's development they were really good star trek stories but in 22 24 minutes mm-hmm. you know there's yeah, it feels there's they no feel like super space condensed tng episodes absolutely yeah with more humor yeah and things they can do because it's a cartoon like have cations and things like that precisely right i mean far easier to do it in, in animation which they capitalize upon brilliantly just as the original yep. animated series did yep. as well which i really enjoy yeah get to see different aliens and things they do allude that they're out there and the federation things but you know you just don't get to see them yeah precisely right 
here you can you can have them all over the place, right? Uh, but it's Tendi's first day. Yeah. It's kind of our point of view character in the first episode. She's sort of introducing us to the ship, yeah. Yeah. And all uh, the the lower decks crew, because Boimler's her like uh, a kind of attache, <laughs> haplessly attempting to help her. Yeah. Uh, while basically sort of shining himself at every opportunity. You want to go see the warp core? It's the coolest part of the ship. Oh my god, I want to see the warp core. <laughs> warp core is so boring. What? Warp core is the best. Let's go. Woo. We love the warp core, but like I think we share that. If someone like. Yes. If we were on a starship, how often would one of us say to the other, "So you, you, like, what, you want to you want to go to the warp core?" <laughs> it's like it's break time. You yeah, want to just break time. You want to go uh, have go a grab a cup of coffee and go by the warp core. <laughs> exactly. Um, That'd be pretty awesome. Um, um, it's great. Oh, that would be great. Hey, Jordy, or whatever ship we're on. You know, I'm putting us on this That's flagship. True. That's kind of it. Presumptuous. <laughs> little brig for your britches yeah, there, sir. Yeah, so. Um, I think I just accidentally said a little brig for your britches. You did say a little brig for my britches, so I guess I'm going to the brig due to my britches. Oh, pants locker. Oh, my. First um, for everything. Well, second, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> After that disastrous debutante ball on Perengana. So, yeah, attendee, she kind of hits it off with Rutherford. Mm-hmm. They're good buddies. Yeah, but yeah. I, well, each of them, I think, are trying to find somewhere to fit in, while their sort of foil in this Mariner is trying to find everywhere to show that she is not fitting in. And there's a zombie virus. And this. there's a zombie virus. People turn into zombies. Yeah. <laughs> it's Again, kind of funny though. Zombies being kind of zeitgeist of the times. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we'll do it. Star Trek zombie episode. Well, I, it's like, oh, I, this show's going to be fun. <laughs> well, I th- you know, and I, I, th- I mean, how many times have, you know, there been mind control things from the weird gelatinous pancakes in the original series to the game? Mm-hmm. Uh, to all sorts of stuff, right? It's the game. Uh, but this is, uh, yeah, that was great fun. <laughs> it really did sort of go into that sort of Walking Dead Z Nation kind of yeah. zombie shtick. It was great. Episode two, on Voice. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the one where Rutherford's like switching all the positions on the ship where he's like in command one second and then he's in oh uh, yeah he's a doctor's assistant in the next one and he's sort of slotting out his skill sets and things right yeah he doesn't know where he fits and he's trying to find out yeah (laughs) Jax puts him in program smorgasbord I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I wonder if this thing has a, a, a defense setting. <laughs> <laughs> the, that's supposed to be the program that gets people's asses kicked, basically. Yeah. And, uh, what he takes out about the holographic drones in a very short time. Yeah, pretty good. One of my favorite, th- I think that's the episode where he says, you know, I need to leave. And they're like, great! But he, he proved to be... Yeah. Their reaction to him wanting to move yeah, on. Yeah, super positive. Just, was yeah, lovely. follow your heart, man. That's great. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you go for it. I uh, I thought, you know, that's that's one of those moments where where you see the the sense of is it McMahon who says, you know, this is a love letter to TNG, yeah. basically. That sense that these people's values really are built around self development and the good of the whole. Thank you. And it's it, I, I love it that it lands as the joke because in one sense yeah. you sort of expect them to be like because yeah. it's Shax too and Shax is hardcore. <laughs> yeah. And of course he's too much of an engineer to be a nurse. Yes. <laughs> he's like, Well what happened to you anyway? He's just like, Oh my burns. He's like, What kind of burns? He's just like, oh you know Dilithium birds, how are you alive, man? You should be dead <laughs> Excellent bedside. <laughs> On boys. And that's also the one where uh, there's Beckett's old friend, uh, Corinne, the Klingon. Oh, yes. Who apparently steals a lot of things. <laughs> and of course, in the command, when um, Rutherford's doing command, he gets put in the command simulator. What should we do, Captain? Uh, uh, ma- 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 maintain course. <laughs> ma- ma- maintain course. Oh. He's like, dude, next time that that you know, it fails, of course. He's like, dude, next time something like that happens, do the Janeway protocol. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that's the next scenario. And he's just like, there's an asteroid field ahead, Captain. What should we do? He's just like, initiate Janeway protocol. They're like, are you sure, Captain? He's like, yes. 
Like, oh my god, sir. The kindergarten on deck seven. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. becomes the worst disaster ever <laughs> so not really ready <laughs> Rutherford has a particular skill set yes yeah. uh, but you know that question of identity for him is going to continue on you know he's going to try personalities he's going to try moods he's going to try all sorts of things mm -hmm. he goes, oh, yeah I really want to know why he has that cybernetic implant <laughs> like, did he get the side of his head blown off and have to I don't know. get a replacement? Like, what's going on with that? Anyway. I also want to know. Episode 3, Temporal Edict. Mm-hmm. The captain finds out about buffer time. Which, yeah. how did she not know? She had to rise up through the ranks. I don't know about that. She, she was yeah. a straight and narrow. With it. She was pretty straight and narrow, that uh, Carol Freeman. Maybe nobody ever told her about it because of, yeah. of that very thing. She's a Boimler type. Like, he was shocked by the whole thing. He's like, we... That's just not an efficient use of time, guys. We can't be doing that. Scotty uses buffer time all the time, and he was trying to tell Jordy about yeah. buffer time in his own way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Jordy really, didn't tell really him didn't how long get... it would really take, did you? <laughs> of course I did. Laddie! Yeah, not Jordy's attitude to, to how to do that. No, he's like, no, way. Picard pushes me around. He's like, no. that's, that's, that's... You know, Picard also, you know, asks me things he believes implicitly in. Actually, he's not bad. It's Cisco's the worst. He just has to tell O'Brien. He's just like, how long are the repairs going to take, O'Brien? He's just like, about eight hours. And he's just like, this is a situation. O'Brien actually meant eight hours. <laughs> he's like, you've got two. Yeah. I and mean, Cisco wants the Defiant. You best be having the Defiant ready. This also has some interesting stuff between Ransom and Mariner in it, I think, doesn't it? <laughs> on an away mission? Yes, they go on an away mission. She shows up with her sleeves rolled up. He's just like... Hey, we're gonna roll down those sleeves. This isn't a burn. <laughs> yeah, they really have not much time for each other at all. Ransom's a very like by the books guy too, which we see more in this episode down on the planet. He's like a very Starfleet kind of guy. Oh yeah, kind of a Riker meets Boimler, almost in a way. He's um, interesting. He he. There are moments of him that also maybe because it's animated remind me of. The um, oh gosh, the terrible intergalactic adventurer guy from Futurama. I knew you were gonna say that score one for the zapper. <laughs> That's it. Zap, Zap Brannigan. Brannigan. <laughs> yeah, he is a Zap Brannigan type in a way, but better. Like Zap Brannigan's horrible at what he does, and he's just like a kind That's of phony. True. Yeah, but uh, uh, Ransom at least has competence on his side. That's true. Care for some champagne? <laughs> Actually, I, I quite like Ransom as a character. He's, I do too. He, he grates a bit. He, Voiced he, by he Jerry O'Connell, who I also have. Oh, he's got for. great comedy chops, yeah. too. Um, yeah, 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 Ransom. Classically from what? My Secret Identity, I think, wasn't it? In a, oh, from definitely My Secret Identity. Also, Stand By Me. That's true. That's true. And, and a, a movie fan. that is I surprisingly like called Joe's Apartment, where he, it's him and a bunch of cockroaches that talk. But oh, I, I, yeah. I used to love that movie. I remember that. Movie. Yeah. That was an odd comedy, but I did enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, and of course, Sliders, which I loved. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Jonathan Reese davies and all sorts of crazy stuff. Oh, man. Yeah. Good, good show. Great stuff. So the, yeah, they, he's got a pretty long sci-fi history. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, shuttle they take down to this planet is mm -hmm. the Yosemite. The Yosemite. Which we do see the Yosemite again later in the series. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they may have shuttles named after... What, geysers? Were natural parks in the U.S.? I'm thinking maybe parks, yeah. Yeah? It'd be interesting, be interesting to see yeah. where the... Uh, I don't know if we see any other named shuttles over the series. Hmm, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Yeah. So they go down to the planet where there's crystal worshippers. Mm-hmm. And they don't... And they present them with wood, which was, of course, a terrible mistake because their enemies are the wood worshippers. Um, yes. And um, Ransom and Mariner end up in prison there. Mm-hmm. And... They're told that one of them has to partake in mortal combat against uh, this giant, hulking, uh, warrior-looking figure. Mm -hmm. And they immediately fight for who gets to do that. Because they both <laughs> Those two. Really, like, the guy's like, you realize you, you're fighting over who know, gets to be cut mean. in half by this guy. I believe is what he's doing. Like, give me it, give me it, give me it, give me it. I want it, me. <laughs> so then Ransom stabs Mariner in the foot. So oh, that's right. She's like, what the fuck? Like, what's wrong with you? Oh, man. Great episode. 
But he, this is where you see how bad the book is. So he goes and fights that guy. And he's like, you know, of course, doing the Kirk double hand, double oh, yeah. fist smash. He's like, interlocked hands! <laughs> <laughs> double fist smash! <laughs> they give a weapon. He's like, all I need is my double fist. <laughs> But, like, the whole time he's beating on this guy, he's just like, I respect your sovereignty! (laughs) (laughs) Man, he's like, so ethical. And that's where you start to see a little thing between them for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she really, like, she, she, deep down, she loves Star. Yeah. But she's just become... Like, she's a ransom-type character when she's not being... Absolutely. And, you know, she's... Purposeful miscreant. <laughs> well, I, sh- I think somewhere along the line, it feels like she lost faith in herself as much as in Starfleet. And she's just trying to show that she's not really up to it. Or something, right? I mean, her... her, her and in a much later episode, her friend calls her out on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ransom, all right, you guys get out of my quarters. I need to work out to think about what you said. So, like, you've been working out this entire time. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be jacked for those arena fights. It's true. Uh, how else do you think Riker got like that with those Klingons in the Gorn quest? Interlocked hands. <laughs> and oh. Of course, at the end there. Shaq's just like, look, I'm with you guys, a bunch of wood worshiping freaks. <laughs> Am I right? But these, you know, that's funny because Bajorans worship orbs, which are kind of crystal like in their Absolutely. appearance. So he's all he understands the crystal worshippers, right? Wood worshippers, like what? <laughs> but I, that is one of the things I do love about uh, Lower Decks as a series. They really lean into the notion of diversity. Yeah. In the sense that you know, like that the aliens are. They can be really alien mm-hmm. and sort of, I don't know how I put it, sort of unapologetically so. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very, very different. And that's in some of the exist. ones that we've seen before in like the anime series, like the... Uh, the Yodoans, yeah. The Yodoans, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good... Oh, yeah. We'll get to that one, too. The Farm! <laughs> Episode 4, Moist Vessel. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, they're trying to force Beckett to request a transfer. So um, they give her... All the worst jobs on the ship. But she finds a way to make them all fun, so that doesn't really work. And you get some interesting looks at what the worst jobs on a starship are. Holodeck uh, yeah, cleaning. Yeah, cleaning the beep filter <laughs> from, the, from the holodecks. <laughs> Captain's like, they used it for that? Uh, it, it's mostly that. It's <laughs> mostly that. But yeah, yeah, see, that's the thing. Freeman doesn't know anything that's going on in Starfleet around her, it seems. That seems to be her whole thing. She's uh, she's a bit. She's the perfect captain for the worst ship in the fleet, I suppose. Like I love her as a character, but she definitely doesn't seem to know what's going on. Or what's well, Starfleet. no, no, she doesn't. I don't think. I just I think that Freeman was not one of those people who socialized a lot. Yeah. Like just maybe a bit of a an, an introverted person who was happy. maybe a reg type, but not quite so. Uh... Exactly right. Someone who who was happy, sort of. Doing the study, doing the work, doing the advancement, getting like just doing that, and just just that's what makes them happy, you know. Mm-hmm. But it means that I wonder, like, she's just not up on a lot of the social bits. No. And her daughter is extraordinarily different. Yeah. Her daughter's very gregarious, even when she's sort of doing it in a backward kind of way. A commando type. She can like very capable decisive. Yeah. Kind of yeah, and I think probably shares that with with a with a captain mom, but. Yeah, they they have very different personalities. Even mm-hmm. though I think some aspects. Whatever, of Carol. Them... You did not just call me Carol. <laughs> Whatever, Carol. <laughs> and, uh, you can tell like there's there's some moments where they're different, and the, mo- the moments where they're similar are really what drive each other up. Yeah, they're like uh, scaling. Down, speaking of a wall, they're scaling down that. Oh, that's cliff right. Together. <laughs> Slow it, Beckett. Make sure it does this. Look, maybe, 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 maybe I should just go first. <laughs> I'm good at this. <laughs> this is what I'm good at. Holy crap. Well, I can only imagine how challenging it would be to to be growing up with two increasingly high-ranked Starfleet officers as parents. Who are, of course, probably pressuring you into Starfleet. Well, and have high expectations because they've achieved great things themselves, right? Mm. Yeah, I can see a lot of ways in which... I mean, some of what she's doing is acting out to receive attention from her mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, which may also have been something that's been a pattern with her over her life, given that 
they've spent long periods in space, possibly with their parents separated. Mm -hmm. Or, as we see in episodes like Brothers from <laughs> TNG, actually Family? the episode <laughs> Brothers, um, sometimes uh, kids might be on a ship by themselves and their parents sabbatical somewhere else, right? Mm. So she may have spent Actually. long periods of time, much like the uh, generations that grew up going Jeremy, to boarding whatever, school. Jeremy. I think so. You know, in the British Empire and that sort of thing, who would have grown up largely apart from their parents. Uh, and so their relationship and the moments in which they're going to relate to each other become very heightened, very important moments. I found this one to be a very dense episode. This one definitely felt like a full TNG episode yeah. kind of condensed. Had your A and B plot both really kind of fleshed out guest characters like Captain Durango mm -hmm. and uh, the Admiral who says censors. Oh, yes. <laughs> Are you making power of me? He's great. Censors, yes, yes, yes. That sounds right to me. Yes, Captain Freeman's playing <laughs> along. Yes, I also say censors. <laughs> Harry's like, no, you don't. This is crazy. What? <laughs> it's the only correct way to say it. Sensors. Sen yes, yeah, sensors. Yeah, sensors. Tuvok agrees. And so do we here on Locutors. <laughs> Locutors like sensors. Yes, Locutors love sensors. Um, and it also has, of course, the B plot of Ascension Guy. Oh, He's right. trying to ascend. That's or right. Is he? he actually wasn't just pretending to try to ascend. Just stand Ten out and have a is thing. Is it Tendy that desperately tries to help him yes, do this? Yes, Tendy just wants to see somebody ascend. And then yeah. she gets obsessed with him because she messes up his ascension and now somebody doesn't like her and she can't handle that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I just can't handle when somebody doesn't like me. So, <laughs> and anyway, that, they become best friends and almost die together. And then they save each other's lives. <laughs> and then he does ascend and it's horrible and prolonged. <laughs> and it's, oh, I forgot. <laughs> it's sad and it actually burns a little bit. Oh my, oh my god, oh my god, why is this taking so long? I don't want to ascend. <laughs> She's like, just, you know, roll, roll into corporeal, roll, roll, roll back into it. I am everything. <laughs> the universe is balanced on the back of a koala. Why is he smiling? What does he know? <laughs> hmm. Oh, man. That was intense. The first time I saw that scene, I might was racing I was, that was an intense scene. i really loved that scene actually you know i mean it i mean it, it reminded me of this moment in uh the fido of plato where it, which is a dialogue where he talks about dogs socrates dying right this is the death of socrates where he drinks the hemlock and then talks with his friends and then lies down on the couch at the end um and dies uh but in the midst of it he talks about um trying to literally have kind of mystical experience right or sort of mystical union and he he says you know the 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 problem can be figured like staring at the sun to really become identified with the sun in that sense is to lose your sight or to be annihilated in that sense and so he says what i use is a second best method like seeing the sun reflected in a pond and, and sort of studying that or that reflection and then of course you know he dies in hemlock at the end of that the dialogue right and there, there's, a, there's a mirroring there for me. Uh, Hemlock makes a good tea. You just can't drink too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, that was, a, that was a surprisingly sort of sort of almost Lovecraftian ending to that, yeah. that episode. And Durango's you know? cool. We don't get to see Tellerite that often. It was cool seeing yeah. Tellerite. Right yeah. Captain, even though he gets kind of, he makes a big mistake because he seems to be sort of jealous of Carol or something like that. I don't know what's going on between those two. It's kind of weird. No, it's true. They used to a... serve together on the Illinois. Oh, well, that's right. That's right. But the other thing, I, the other thing I love about that episode is the poker game. They're like executive poker game because they then they promote Mariner. Oh, that's like, right. That's the best way to get her. They make her a lieutenant, response. don't they? Yeah. So it's just a poker game, and apparently they just all fold every hand. <laughs> this game's about to get interesting. <laughs> fold. <laughs> Jack, Terrible like, poker. Jack's like, good ups, good ups. <laughs> he's always impressed by the folds. Like, he's always impressed by it. He's, you know, they promote Mariner. He's just like, ah, oh, Mariner, Weller. <laughs> he doesn't pay attention, so he just assumes. <laughs> oh, okay. And I'm going to miss him, Shax. So we're going to get into that later. Yeah. Episode 5 Cupid's Errant Error. Mm -hmm. That's right. This is one of those no, you don't really have a girlfriend sort of. You know, an extended version sure of that. Sure, you have joke. a girlfriend in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Well, we wouldn't know her, right? On right, Vancouver. Right. That's right. Which is funny because they do a lot of like California kind of names and references in the show, and Vancouver is kind of like the 
our little Hollywood court. Yeah, it's true. It's our sort of Hollywood in the north, yeah. right? Barbara Brinson is his real, real girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Real girlfriend. That's true. Not an alien. Yeah. Not a parasite. Not an alien parasite. That was actually Boimler. So I kept saying <laughs> lover. It's been a long time since I've taken a lover. Dude, stop saying lover. <laughs> <laughs> they take the creature and it's like, lover, 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 lover. <laughs> so weird. Oh, Mariner walks in on him. <laughs> oh. She pants the girl. <laughs> She's oh. an alien, see? Shoo. Like, it's, it's amazing. It was it was certainly one of the cringier episodes of the whole series. There were a lot of moments where I was like, oh no, don't do it. And of course, Tenny and Rutherford love the Vancouver, think it's the greatest ship they've ever seen. Mary's is like, dude, it's like the same as the Serena. So they're like, what are you kidding me? Let's go see like the the who's it, the bulkheads. Probably double lattice. Double lattice. <laughs> <laughs> they're looking for those T eighty eights. Yeah, they're 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 competing for T eighty eight. T eighty eight. Oh, that's right, out. competing for the T eighty eight. Yeah, because the, uh, some the uh, engineer says they can keep them. Mm -hmm. One of them gets to keep. And yep. Tendy slaps him in the face to see if he's real. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> making sure this wasn't. <laughs> but it's funny though. Like Boyle's girlfriend comes walking up, and Mary's just like, uh, uh, end end simulation. And program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good episode. One of the more, uh, to me, one of the more sort of straightforwardly comedic episodes. Yep. Yeah, we. Yeah, uh, funny episode. We first, I mean, we see the sort of that interesting dynamic between Mariner and Boimler developing, where they're. She's really looking out for him in that one. She is. She's re She re like they've become honestly good friends, even though they refuse to admit it. Because yeah. they're both the kind of person each other wouldn't really like. Yeah, you know, or like or admit to anyway. Yeah, and it's it, it's funny because it's sort of it 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 has in that sense the structure almost of a rom com, but they're becoming friends. But they're, yeah, which I like though so much better. I, I, the I easy really way out and like too that. much storytelling is the romantic angle. And Absolutely, like... and you know you can have you can have whatever tensions in the dynamic you want, but I love it that. Um, yeah, they be, what really happens is they become very very fast friends mm -hmm. over the course of that season. Mm -hmm. uh, and a good form for each other because in a way they're also what the other person needs. Absolutely. Yeah, they make it ultimately a pretty good team. Yeah. So then we have episode six, Terminal Provocations? Temporal Provocation? Terminal, Terminal provocations. provocations. Terminal Provocations. Where we have Fletcher. Yeah, the awkward but lovable Ensign Fletcher. He's kind of hapless. Yeah. Uh, He's a, uh, was he Boimler's buddy from... Back in the academy? I think so, yeah. Uh, and we also have the first appearance oh, of the... Badgy. Dastardly Badgy. I mean, uh, the, the the very embodiment of... <laughs> He's a slow both, loader. Like, the, 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 that old clippy from Windows. Yeah. It's... And the holodeck glitch. Yeah, he's, he's just murderous. <laughs> or it, yeah. ba Badgy, is murderous. Well, you know, Rutherford wasn't being very nice. Had never quite did finish Badgy. Oh no! I think Badgy was well. He 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 just you know there were some glitches. There definitely some glitches. There were some glitches. Yeah. Of course, Badgy does return. Yes, Badgy makes kind of an interestingly anti-heroic return. Yeah, I will get uh, into that here soon. But yeah, I like that uh, a lot. Me too. But yeah, yeah, good episode. Good uh, episode. Maybe not my favorite. Badgy was certainly the most memorable part of it. Yeah. Fletcher was fun, but you know that's okay. So we move on to Season 1, Episode 7. Yes. Much Ado About Boimler. Much to do about Bradward. That's right. All right. So we have Mariner's friend, who's a captain. Oh, yes. Visiting. Uh, and and uh, her, she's surprised that Beck is still an ensign, because they went to the academy together, these two, and they were kind of uh, projected to end up in the same place, sort of, at the same Indeed. time. And, and I think gives us a pretty good picture of the length thus far of Beckett Mariner's career. Mm -hmm. We know she's serving in 2380 and through much of the 2370s. Mm -hmm. We don't actually, I think, know when she was born or or how old she is, right? Uh, she may be significantly older than Tandy or, mm -hmm. or Boimler. Yes, we don't really... You right. just kind of assume she's the same age as Boimler, but... She, I would guess she might be in her mid-30s or something, you know? Mm-hmm. 
not that it matters too much, but just gives her a little bit more time for that career growth that would allow her friend to already be a captain, mm-hmm. who's obviously clearly a, a quick promotion track as well, seems to. And uh, Boimler himself has had a transporter accident. Oh, no. He is out of phase. Oh, yeah. Not as badly out of phase as Jordan <laughs> and Rowe were that. of Rutherford's experiment, wasn't it? I think so. You yeah. know, it's just cosmetic. That's right. <laughs> just <laughs> cosmetic out of phase, because you you're still no. fine. Yeah, it's just a... Uh, yeah, he just walks in and tries to continue like his day. <laughs> it's like, what does that sound? It's just cosmetic. It's just cosmetic. Oh, yeah. And we get a while, doctor to honor. While uh, Rutherford does, I think, figure out how to turn off the annoying wine noise after a while, yeah. he's still out of face. And so <laughs> uh, is sent to uh, a place where he can get the treatment he needs. He's going to the farm. With the other freaks. <laughs> <laughs> he's put on board a ship, a kind of a menacing-looking Starfleet ship. Yeah, yeah it's it funny comes out of a lightning so storm, accidents basically. accidents in Star Trek, but they always get reversed. It's true. These are the ones that don't, and that's hilarious. And they do have a place for them to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We see, an, we see, we see a Warp Dylan. 10 Salamander. That's true. We do see a Warp 10 Salamander. Mm-hmm. Um, a guy who's aging and de-aging. Oh, yeah. He's sort of like... Two halves of his body. People that are uh, like transported together, fused in like a transporter. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Oh, there's uh, people in little pike boxes. Yeah. Yeah, several that have, what were those, gamma burns or something like that? So, yeah, there's all sorts of... Like a dilithium explosion, with... maybe? Oh, yeah, maybe it's dilithium. Uh, dilithium burns, you should be dead! <laughs> These are people, yeah, whose wounds have meant that they require a very high level of treatment. Hmm. Perhaps treatment for their entire lives. Yeah, and correct. possible yeah. Boimler might be one of them. Now, in the midst of all of this, Tandy... <laughs> And Rutherford have gone and done something fun. Was Rutherford part of that too? Well, no, but he just ends up following it around. Oh, yeah. Uh, Tandy has cooked herself up a pet. Yes. Hmm. And she's made herself dog. Uh, a perfectly normal... Human dog. Human dog. Human dog? Earth dog. Earth dog. <laughs> <laughs> a human dog. Human dog. Well, Terran that's dog. sort of more what Tandy thought. Well, that's true. Uh, who, of course, does all the normal dog things like talking and... Breathing fire. Randomly opening his neck hole to show a gaping, many-toothed maw for a moment. Turning into a cube and rolling away. That's true. <laughs> Flying. Yeah. You know, dogs don't do that, right, Tandy? They don't? <laughs> what? <laughs> if a dog ends up staying on the farm. And it turns out dog is apparently relatively harmless. Oh, sure. Just a happy, just a happy Labrador golden retriever monster. But in that sense, very much dog just just loves Tandy and is kind of happy. But uh, yeah, can't can't apparently imagine going anywhere but the farm, and will love being mm. there. It's a nice place. Now, in the end, Mariner, of course, decides to drop what her friend calls on her as an act. She's been bumbling and mm-hmm. messing things up, and caught flat-footed and unprepared, and. Her friend has finally had enough. And this, I think, is a really interesting turning moment in the whole series. We call her the friend because neither Dave nor I can remember her name. I'm so bad with names. Even when I, you know, have the internet in front of me, I'm bad with names. So, yeah, the two of them manage to avert the crisis that has befallen them. And I think, you know, for the first time, Mariner, in a long time, Mariner feels like kind of herself. Mm-hmm. In a way that she's happy with. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, to me, that's being recalled. Like, that that brought me back to a discussion we had a while ago about how we saw the differences between, say, well, just what we were discussing at that moment were our two favorite captains, mm-hmm. uh, Picard and Cisco, And that, in one sense, for Picard, the Federation is an abstract set of ideals. And that's what appeals to him about it. You know, that draws him... Through his life. And for Cisco, it's the relationships, it's the camaraderie, it's the loyalty, it's the belief in what they can do together. It's the uniform. Mm-hmm. And I think for Mariner, it's starting to look like, or at least it's being hinted at in this episode, that what is sort of her Starfleet ideal is 
literally just being her best self and letting herself be that unabashedly like getting over that kind of she knows her high ironic self deprecation that she's involved in right mm -hmm. uh and the kind of parodying and she's never going to be the kind of sincere anxious guy that boimler is or the kind of just overflowing enthusiasm of tandy and rutherford but Pudding! She's a great uh... Starfleet officer, right? She's, yeah, an, she's, she's an incredibly competent officer. Which is why I put her on my dream crew and we see in an episode where the captain's just like, Mariner, I need a crazy plan now. Exactly. <laughs> like, Come okay, up with uh... one. That's what you do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought, you know, it was it's a, yeah, a really, really great moment uh, in, in Mariner's character. And a fun, a fun reversal of things in the uh, the farm B plot. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the Adoan captain who just turns yeah. out to be. <laughs> he's like creepy, but he's not. He's, he's like it's, they just it's just his dark whole affect is creepy, uh, but he seems like a lovely guy. Yeah, it's just like he didn't realize how creepy and weird and ominous the whole ship seemed. Yeah, it just yeah. may have been perfectly happy for any Adoan. You know, yeah. they don't like it. It's just like. Cardassians like it darker and hotter. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but it's like super is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is very creepy. Uh, and then, you know, it arrives out of a storm and bang. Yeah. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Boiler reverts to his bad instincts. And they, of course, they and all that. decide that the farm is not real. All the people on the ship. Because a lot of them have been on it for a long time. Mm -hmm. But it's like they're mm -hmm. just going from place to place to pick all these people up. But they've all decided that the farm is not real. Yeah, and, and if, you know, if they're traveling at warp you know, right. Federation standard, which is about warp five, yeah. it will take them months to go places. Yeah, so they could well have been on this place for months or years. Or something. But interesting, they weren't given any treatment and all that time. <laughs> <laughs> just just in this dang cold. <laughs> it's therapeutic for them, says the captain. <laughs> no, look, we're getting to the farm eventually. <laughs> <laughs> just suffer till we get there yeah, that was funny oh. what's the next episode crisis point next episode is called veritas oh veritas veritas Jeez. looking for the truth so this this, this has the... all the hallmarks of a trial yes yeah, so we didn't bring that up in our justice episode mm -hmm. the we characters didn't... come up you know on a mm -hmm. raised up thing into a bright light there's a Hit of eels. There's even the clangy glove thing to with the spikes, gavel guards. Yeah, mm. uh, you know all the and and you know the the sort of gallery of looming ominous onlookers. <laughs> Everything that would make you think of a Klingon or a Cardassian style trial, at the very least. Turns out they were only renting that space for about an hour. <laughs> 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 I'm like, setting up for my daughter's birthday party. They're like, who's that guy? He's, like, he's all this creepy guy. He's like, oh, I'm just you know, waiting for my uh, my daughter. <laughs> yeah, so this this really takes the premise of the episode Lower Decks in a certain sense and runs with it to brilliant comedic effect. We see four completely disjoint accounts of what each of our lower deck support crew were involved in. They don't really line up, and particularly Rutherford's, but all of them don't really entirely make sense as to what's really happening. It's a beautiful way of, and a really funny way of depicting that, you know, that old saw about, you know, truth being like an elephant in a dark room, and I found the end of the trunk, and you found, you know, his knee back there mm -hmm. somewhere, and Somebody else has found the end of an ear, and we all think we've got the whole darn thing. I found the peanut. <laughs> the pea what? <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out their lack of understanding of what's going on in the upper decks regions of the ship and the story uh, extends even to the room they're in. Their command crew who were suspended in in, in light are yeah they're just it's just uh, the light of adulation or something i forget what it's called uh yeah a great a great sort of um upside down sort of story mm -hmm. you know uh yeah. left is right yeah they all have their different 
version of the story, you know, they're still they all have the same goal and they still can't tell the same story. <laughs> but that's I like the kind of synoptic character of truth there, right? Yeah. Because well, each one of them is telling the truth as they know it, but there's no guarantee that any of us has access to a sufficient amount of the truth. It's like they say the worst testimony is eyewitness testimony. Absolutely, right? (laughs) I mean, especially when your cybernetic implant is going on and off repeatedly. (laughs) That doesn't help. Now, from there, we move on to Crisis Point. (gasps) Crisis Point. A a brilliant piece of satire, let's just say right off the bat. You want want to bask? We we generally like to bask. I like to bask. Oh, we are delicious. Well, we are delicious. <laughs> no, so, you don't have to be eaten by these people. Oh. <laughs> what? No, no, don't we, we, that's no, not no, like, true. Wouldn't you like to be? Wouldn't you like to bask without being under threat of being eaten by these people? Like, well, that, that sounds pretty nice. <laughs> so we open on uh, <laughs> Mariner. <laughs> Mariner thinks she's doing a good thing here. Yeah, doing what looks like a complete breach of the Prime Directive in the process. Uh, Two, she's... but not unlike ones we've seen oh, before. Sure, sure. Mm. No, no, no. But, mm. again, one of those one of those real... Has all the hallmarks of a breach of the Prime Directive. Yep. Uh, the captain beams down. They get in an argument about this. Yep. And, again, one of those moments where the series really displays its deafness at really condensing a story... And communicating it through the bare essentials plus great visuals and animation. Great you know, visuals. They the cold open of that story thing. feels like an entire episode in itself. <laughs> it's I, I, I literally, it turned on. I thought, did I, did I, just a minute, did I start watching this episode already by accident? <laughs> cool, the reptile episode. <laughs> exactly. The reptile and rat people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then it takes a whole different turn. Yeah, she starts a holodeck program. Mm hmm. Or hijacks boilers, I think. Hijacks boilers, yeah. Because he's, of course... Oh, yeah, she just, like, programs all this stuff in, like, three seconds. Because Boimler has... Yeah, he's created an entire faithful reproduction yeah. of the ship and all of its inhabitants inside the holodeck. And she creates a Beckett Mariner production starring Beckett Mariner. <laughs> <laughs> Bradward Boimler. Let the, uh, let the, yeah, the psychoanalytic undertones just roll along here samantha rutherford <laughs> um yeah it has lovely really sort of star trekky openings as well yeah. and uh a lot of lot, lens lot flare of this lens a lot of flaring. lens a lot, lot of lens flaring. flare in this episode and has has again a lot of interesting kind of love letter to star trek moments there are clear uh references to con mm-hmm. in this <laughs> Several versions of Khan, <laughs> as well as the kinds of stories that were sort of appropriate to Captain Proton and things like that. There's some stuff like that in there that feels mm-hmm. uh, fanciful in that way as well. What's your take? I think this is the episode of Lower Decks that is actually trying to say something. A little hmm. meta, in a way, here. Okay. Um, More meta than their usual, just sort of meta humorous. Meta, like stuff. we're aware of the wackiness of Star Trek, and we're poking fun of it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beyond but more that, meta than that. So, what in, in what sense do you mean? I think this was perhaps I don't know if it was Mike McMahon or somebody else writing it or whatever. I think it was an attempt to show that the things that uh, like Mike McMahon grew up with, and he mm-hmm. liked the TNG mm-hmm. and stuff, and what this is like shows a love letter to. Is can still be done in an updated fashion. Uh huh. You mean we don't have to? We don't have to. We don't like. I think it's obviously poking fun at the lens flares in the. Oh sure. The, yeah, yeah. Some the, of those the, aesthetic the choices. Two thousand nine movie and the ones after uh-huh. that and beyond. And don't you know? I like two Star Trek 09, actually. Well, it's a fun movie. Yeah, it's a fun, Real movie. fun movie. And you know the the thing I think it's it, it, it says in some ways most successfully to me now that you got me thinking about it this way is that some of the grimmest elements of star trek nevertheless occur in that overall frame uh that we've come to know as sort of like the star trekiness of the story Mm -hmm. uh it's not that there's no conflict Mm -hmm. even though gene roddenberry was pretty against conflict among crew members and we see more of that developing the further we get from gene roddenberry Mm -hmm. 
even over Deep Space Nine, there's really brilliant space for conflict there. But those dynamics are faithfully adhered to because these are sort of real grown-up Starfleet officers doing their thing. Mm. Yeah, there's very little room for, I don't know, I, and, and I don't want to be disparaging by using this word, but there's very little room for what I would call sort of melodrama in Star Trek the way I understand the point you're making. There's a lot of drama. There could be tension. There could be excitement. There could be all sorts of stuff. But it's ultimately the, the the sort of logic that the show is operating on that defines the ways in which the stories will tend to resolve themselves. Mm. And there are some standout episodes that don't like the Scria mm-hmm. from from Deep Space Nine, uh, the Crystalline Entity. Uh, you know, that's one of those ones that kind of brings to a punctuated, jagged stop. Uh, the whole thrust of what the show is trying to do, but by virtue of that, highlights it. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah that's a really great point. Uh, clearly, you set off some fireworks in my head there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they're obviously having some fun. Yeah. With, with the movies a bit in that episode. For sure. And I think, you know, they do get the sense in which the movies also, like, raise the stakes every time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, the, psychoana- uh, the psychoanalytical quality of Mariner fighting Mariner. Yeah. And being the worst Mariner. <laughs> because how her logs represent her and how her friends see her and how even Boimler sees her, that shows up in the holodeck representation. Well, they replaced Boimler with a Shempo. Well, that's true. Poor Shempo. Oh, Shempo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shempo was great. But, um, you know, the, but Boimler, as the programmer, in that yes, sense, who seen it, right? Uh, who who knows her? It makes the point, you know. Uh, uh, Sartre decades ago made the point that sometimes other people know us better than we know ourselves because they see us from angles we don't. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, both you know literally and and metaphorically. I think that that's true here as well. And she's brought to this confrontation with who she thinks she is and who she sees, and it all falls apart. And it's really yeah, very well done. So. <gasps> On to maybe their best titled episode in the series, in, in, in the season. I like that. Maybe no their best everything in the season. Pretty great episode. Ooh. The return of the Packlids. Indeed. And even though this isn't. And it a really Star Trek evolved movie, them into something different. Which oh, yeah. I thought an it was unbelievable thing in a way, I thought. Yep. Consistent just, with who they were and who yeah, they are. I think so. They were shady characters. Absolutely. And they had a drive which easily turned into a, a sort of a violent impulse. Just slow them in that TNG episode. Picard is you're, you're the captain. How long have you been captain of that vessel? Like 15 years and you don't know how it works. Like, Do you know anyone? Is there anyone on your ship who can fix that part? Hold on, I'll ask. <laughs> Hold on, I'll ask. But, you know, that's that's the Packlands being conciliatory because they have they're trying um, to be sneaky. They're trying to be sneaky. And they know that in a straight fight, they probably can't take the penis. But if they can catch them off guard. And I love it that they call every Federation ship uh, the Enterprise. The Enterprise. Um, it's another <laughs> oh, Enterprise. Oh no, it's another Enterprise. <laughs> but again, perfectly reasonable nomenclature from their perspective. We use ship pieces to get ship pieces. And now we have all the ship pieces. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, as I was saying, you know, in, in the midst of all this, it's it's a serious it thing. feels like a Star Trek movie in some ways. Mm-hmm. Because bits of the ship come off. Yeah. And that tends not to happen in episodes. Yeah, even more than Crisis Point, this episode feels like a movie. Absolutely. And I, I love that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I watched them in quick succession the first time I watched them. Mm. And uh, yeah, that, that really struck me that the first one is a sort of a, a sort of a, a satirical send-up and even a kind of a, a bit of an artistic critique of the difference modern between Star Trek and movies and Star Trek. Yeah. And also the modern movies and some other stuff. Yeah. Some of the impulses that are being worked out there. But then they do this episode that feels like it could be a movie, but stays true to all the things that they were making sort of as critiques in that former episode. You know, they kind of, they make their case in nine episodes and then they're like, okay, get ready for it because there's no small parts. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Great yeah. episode. Of course, uh, cameos by William Thaddeus Riker uh-huh. and Deanna Troy. Uh-huh. And the USS Titan. <sighs> gorgeous ship. So oh, gorgeous. A salute to the Titan. May she fly long and far. Yeah. Mariner knows Riker. She's like, yeah, where do you think I get all my contraband? <laughs> like, how much contraband do you have hidden on this ship, Beckett? Like, I don't know, oh. lots, whatever, I don't know. I like she the never discussion knows. about the Jamaharon. This boy wants Jamaharon. He wants Jamaharon. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy but uh of your surround yeah the story the their eventual victory doesn't come without cost oh, oh this makes me sad yeah, yeah it was a, a big heroic moment like definitely yeah. felt like a movie absolutely he grabs uh-huh. rutherford and throws him in a shuttle uh-huh. and they fly into the pack led vessel to upload the virus that badgie came up with Magic <laughs> and she's like, I've already come up with three because I'm always listening. Like, I'm always, always listening. listening. <laughs> it's like the answer. Well, he's even more angry now because now he's just like in this void of listening and he's stuck in there all the time. And like, he's kind of always on. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, my God. Badgie's going to be Badgie back. kind of exists in hell. He's going to, uh, yeah. He's the new Moriarty. Exactly. But there's a lot of great moments in it, right? The shuttle thing reminded me of Data and Worf in the shuttle sneaking onto the Borg ship. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, all sorts of, you know, there's great moments that in themselves were solid pieces of storytelling that had those great links for me. Uh, and that's another one of those things that makes it feel really Star Trek. Of course, uh, Shax sacrifices himself, kicking the crap out of some pack lids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Rocks his paw. Let him but like big, big stakes. You don't expect to see that in a fun cartoon. No, 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 no. I mean, they're, they, they, have, this... they have the Star Trek kind of funeral where they fire his uh-huh. paw out into space. And this is one of the things that impresses me about it as I think they did. as a series. Um, they're both allowing themselves to be a lighthearted comedic series, but also to develop in a more serialized fashion it felt like the death of tasha yar it did it did and it made me think that the whole first season has a coherence better because it's just not being killed by a slime monster yeah yeah you know the but the you know the development that we see there i think is indicative of a way to do star trek that blends the best of what i think we've described as both worlds Mm -hmm. which is that episodic approach that can you know find strange new worlds and civilizations around every corner mixed with great the serialized storytelling that made deep space nine so compelling especially the builds to its crescendo you know, uh, yeah, no, and this yeah. this whole season really built to a brilliant crescendo. That really did. Of course, the Titan comes swooping in, and it's amazing. And this, they're playing the TNG music while they. Oh my god! Oh yeah! Oh my god! I I found myself singing along at that point. Yeah, I was. He's a get him, Riker. I was I was sitting watching it on the the deck on the side of my house, and I realized I was singing quite loudly. and Looked up and. Someone walking their dog to the park near my house beside me was just looking over my fence at the odd man going, da, 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 uh, outside his, his house. But uh, you know what? It's okay. Oh, yeah. One of, the, one, one of the best Riker moments. Oh, yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. I really, you know, that's really what sticks out. Oh, no, another me. Enterprise. <laughs> Okay, one of my favorite lines. <laughs> Mine too. There's so oh, many another Enterprise. Another Enterprise. Yeah, it's just, it's good, solid Star Trek. It is. Right the way through. Well, I think uh, our journey out to the uh, to the Cerritos has brought us back around, limping back to a star base near you. And perhaps our elevation to the upper decks. You never know. I think, for now, 
we've got ourselves to a point where it's uh, appropriate to say, and transmission.